Welcome to Wagon Wheel. Uh, we can ask me chat, uh, ask me questions, so we can chat about things. Um, uh, I got a really good question from uh, Will Cooling, which is a very simple one. Uh, this was over on a Patreon, uh, where you can support us for our podcasts and our videos and I don't know whatever nonsense uh, I also do. Uh, where he just said, just how wacky was England beating Pakistan? I mean, it really was one of the more bizarre moments in in, uh, in of recent times. I don't think the Pakistan side is terrible. Uh, obviously, they have uh, some incredible players. Uh, Shaheen Afridi and Babar Azam pretty much walk into any team they want to, I would have thought, around the world. And there's some other good players in that lineup as well. But essentially... Um, England and uh, England at home, especially, even if it's not the main team, they just have such incredible players playing with such confidence. Um, and they like to smack the ball around and, you know, they, they cause problems for pretty much anyone. I'm not massively surprised um, that their A team did very well because I think a lot of us have been thinking um, that there's just so much depth uh, within this team. There's a couple of players there that um, I didn't think Saki Mahmoud was this good be completely honest with you. I, I saw him in South Africa. I'd seen him play a little bit of county cricket. I thought he was maybe a little bit too slow and didn't quite get the sort of sideways movement that you would expect uh, for someone who isn't 90 plus miles an hour. Um, but in this series, he consistently moved the ball um, and bowled at the top of off stump incredibly accurately. And he, he, well, He's still not over 90 miles an hour, but he's close enough. Uh, he, he really impressed me. Most of the other players out there, um, uh, you know, Phil Salt and uh, who else you got? John Simpson, James Vince. Uh, you know, I knew John Simpson was a good wicketkeeper. I think most people did. I was a bit surprised I didn't go with Ben Cox, but um, I thought John Simpson was certainly a good wicketkeeper. Phil Salt has obviously played in enough leagues in, around the world now for you probably to have picked him up once or twice on the way through. Um, and, yeah, there's certainly been some um, – and James Vince, uh, you can have all the opinions you want in the world on James Vince, but essentially I think we all know that uh, he, he can bat. Can't he? Anyway, I'll get to your questions. Oh, let's see who we've got. I think it was Parv, wasn't it, first? Oh, look at that. Hey, Parv, how you doing? Hello? Well, yeah, how you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Jerry? Uh, very good. What's your question? Okay, uh, my question was that... Uh, uh, see, Ireland and Afghanistan have been given test status for like, I think, four years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like Ireland has played three tests and like Afghanistan has played six tests. So wh when do you think they'll start having like uh, stop these exhibition matches and actually having series on? And yeah, do you I think they'll enter the WTC anytime soon. I don't think they'll enter the WTC anytime soon, no. Uh, so that's, I think that's an easy one to answer there. Um, uh, it, look, it's a good question. Um, and uh, I think, you know, they, they've given these test playing nations status, but then they sort of set up a system where they can't play. Uh, it is very odd um, and it is obviously going to cause problems. Uh, I think it's fair to say, it, uh, even though you're right, they haven't played a lot of tests, that also uh, COVID has um, uh, come at this stage. Um, but I, th I think also the way that test series are planned ahead, I think that, you know, it might take three, four, five years for them to regularly start to get um, series. Um, but you you're right. They're not in, uh, you know, they're not in the World Test Championship and that is going to cause problems. Probably the best way of doing that now is what having a, what would, I'm trying to think what the ICC would do. Let's say, let's say they have nine teams in the World Test Championship, which is probably too many, but okay, they're going to go with nine teams in the World Test Championship. Then they need a second division, don't they? And they need a proper second division of five, seven teams. Um, you know, so whether it be Nepal, Scotland, Netherlands, USA, um, you know, some of the Papua New Guinea, some of the stronger teams. Namibia uh, played some really good cricket of recent times. Oman, they're about to host a, host a tournament. Yay them! Um, uh, you know, I, I think that there's obviously a lot of other strong teams around. Then you could have a system where you'd have a promotion and relegation, which is probably what you should have in, I don't know, any sport ever um, in, in history. But but you're right. I think it's a bit embarrassing at the moment that um, that teams haven't done that. But I think that I think Ireland will be used as a warm up for tests in England by teams going forward. Because if you think about the way that the warm ups currently go, you can't really play the the best team can you you can't really play um uh, you know what's the point of playing derby at second 11 uh, or maybe an england lions team where 
there's just a few 19 year old kids. The best warm up really is going to be against Ireland or Scotland, um, you know, or the Netherlands in, in any of those sort, sorts of situations. So you can see how that will start to help. Now, will that still be one off test? I don't know. Maybe it will. But if you're playing England in three tests, I would have thought coming to Ireland in a couple of tests and playing against Ireland would just be a really good preparation for that. But uh, we will have to see. But uh, thank you so much, Pav. That was a really good question. All right. Uh, Daria? I always say this wrong. No, it's Daria, isn't it? Daria. Uh, Gosh, yeah, Daria. Again. yeah. How you doing, mate? Yeah. I'm good. How are you? Very good. Have you got a question? Yeah. So last week you we were talking about Pat Cummins being the most consistent bowler ever, uh, like the one I've seen. So uh, case come to case cons- comes to mind that the most CBC- accurate. Yeah. Sorry. What I said was is the most yeah. accurate fast bowler ever. Yeah. That, that was my, so, that's my, that's my uh, thing. So not the most consistent bowler ever. I mean, that'd be some some bloke who plays club cricket somewhere who bowls medium pace at forty five miles an hour. <laughs> Yeah, my bad. Sorry for that. So, someone like CDG who bowls at a much slower pace, but uh, is also h- hits the correct lens every time. So, how underrated do you think CDG is? And uh, like we have seen in the WTC final that he provided rest for the other bowlers. While the other bowlers yeah. took rest, he did not concede runs. No, no, you're right. I think, um, I think he's massively underrated. Um, so, so basically the way it works, and it goes back to um, Saki Mahmood, who we were talking about before, you, you, either, you either need to move the ball consistently a little bit at very high pace, or you need to move the ball a lot um, uh, consistently at very slow pace. Those are the only two things that are genuinely going to get you international wickets on a consistent basis. doesn't mean that other things won't get you wickets. Um, bounce is quite ha- um, handy. Obviously, speed is quite handy. Um, you know, being smart, uh, using the crease, all those sorts of things help. But essentially, that's what you need to do. So for c- what CDG does is he, uh, and Colin de Grandhomme, for those who, who um, are not initializing him, whose nickname, I believe, for a long, while, uh, long time was Grand Home Designs. I don't know if Grand Home Designs is still a famous enough show for that to be his nickname. But anyway, w- what he does is he moves the ball a long way. Uh, so, you know, uh, when, when you're getting that much swing, it is very hard to score off someone who is getting that much swing consistently when they're not bowling any bad balls. And he's never probably going to be a consistent wicket taker uh, the way that Pat Cummins is or, you know, the, the top bowlers around the world just because he does lack that extra little bit of pace. But because he is slower, he's not going to bowl many poor balls. And because he does get exaggerated swing, it means that he's always a chance of getting a wicket. I, I think – his bowling average now is, what, 32, 33? I think that's – New Zealand would absolutely take that. Um, uh, I would have thought if even if he had a bowling average of 35, 36, 37, um, and I don't know if he still is, but for a while, I think he was the third – he had the third best economy rate um, in, in test cricket. Or he's certainly in the top, you know, handful of bowlers uh, when it comes to economy rate. So as you said, he's resting their main quicks. He's keeping a little bit of pressure on. It's obviously not quite the same as uh, if they had a really star frontline spinner, uh, but he's keeping a little bit of pressure on. Also, just just randomly, he's the fastest scorer in Test cricket and m- close to the most miserly bowler in Test cricket. Um, yes, he doesn't have a brilliant average in either of those um, disciplines, but he's got a good average in both, realistically, um, which makes him a very, very handy cricketer to have. Um, and I think he allows them to keep pressure on uh, I haven't seen him bowl. Oh, I mean, New Zealand just hasn't played away in Asia enough. Um, and I missed the um, Sri Lanka series when they went there over the last couple of years. I'd really like to see him bowl more in, in Asia and see what he does there. My guess is he probably bowls cutters and he's probably still really accurate. Look, he's not a traditional all-rounder. Uh, you know, I, um, if you've seen some of my videos, you'll see that, you know, I've got a I've got a theory that you're either Ian Botham or you're Derek Pringle, there's like no middle ground between being an all-rounder. You're either a joke, which is probably a bit unfair, or you're an absolute god, um, which is probably a little bit overblown. But essentially, there's a lot of very, very good sort of mid-le- mid-level all-round talent. So Shane Watson was probably one of those sorts of players. And we we tend to not quite give them the respect they deserve because on, on the face of it, their batting and their bowling is not particularly outstanding. 
um, more often than not. I think Watto averaged under 40 with the bat, um, over 30 with the ball, but really didn't bowl very much, especially towards the end of his career. And Colin de Grandholm's obviously in that kind of space, isn't he? That's where he lives. Uh, he's never going to average over 40 with the bat. He's never going to average under 30 with the ball. Um, I, you know, I think that's absolutely fine. What he allows, though, uh, and Neil Wagner allows, is for Colin, Kyle Jameson and Trent Bolt and Tim Southey to be rested. What he allows is um, for um, uh, the rest of the batters, someone like BJ Watling, when he was in the team, they can just go at their own pace, knowing that when the grand home comes in, yeah, he might only average 30 or 35, but he might be able to smash 70 off, you know, about 80 balls um, after they've already put on 200 runs and, and sort of uh, sucker punch the opposition. So, yeah, look, he's obviously not a great player, but I think he's a really, really handy player. I mean, he, he could kind of bowl all day if you needed him to in certain environments. Um, and there are other games where you just don't need him to bowl um, that much. And his batting, I think, if they keep finding wicket keepers who can bat at number six, there's nothing wrong with batting with batting at number seven and averaging uh, mid thirties, uh, especially in modern modern cricket. In the last couple of years, you take that number any day, um, and then to match that with a the best strike rate in the world, um, I really do think that uh, he's a very very handy cricketer. But uh, but yeah, he probably gets more hate and more derision than he should because that's what we do to all rounders. Uh, they're either Ian Botham or they're Derek Pringle, which feels very unfair on Derek Pringle. Thanks for your question. If I got coming up next here, Avi. Avi, you're on the air. I've always wanted to say that. Hi. <laughs> right. So, um, I'm not sure if you've like looked a lot into uh, Indian first class numbers, but um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the fact that Shreya Sayar hasn't gotten a test cap yet. Um, he averages above 52 in first class cricket, strikes at 82. We've seen him. He has a strike rate of 100 in whatever 20 ODIs he's played, he has a strike rate of 97 in List A cricket. Do you think India is missing a chance with letting him get old? Because the only position I see him play technically right now is replacing Rahane if he ends up not scoring. Um, but Shreyas is getting old now. Like He's getting old for a test debut. He's going to turn 27 in, in, in a few months. Mm-hmm. Do you think India is missing a chance by not letting someone like him develop the way we let Kohli develop into test cricket? If you if you've seen his numbers or if you've seen him play uh, at that level, yeah, there's obviously there's quite a few uh, Indian players with really good records domestically, um, and you're probably going to get a similar sort of situation to what happened to Australia in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, Rahane is is a player. I don't know if he still has this, but he's one of the few players with what I call a negative split or a positive split. Maybe is the best way of putting it. He averages more away from home than he does at home. Uh, and he's experienced. He's good when the ball moves sideways. Uh, he is uh, obviously a class player against top quality bowling. He's never going to average 50 in test cricket, and he probably won't ever average 45 in test cricket, especially in the era that we're currently playing in. But they know what they're getting with him, and he complements a lot of the under Indian batters. I, I I just don't have the numbers on I to um, uh, to break break down what he does, but my guess is that he's probably more of a conventional Indian player, where they they possibly see him as a really good player of spin and a really good player in Indian conditions. How that will translate to being an overseas player is a completely different um, situation. They also may not see him as that sort of a number five um, type of batter uh, that you're talking about, but I think there's probably a lot of guys. Uh, that could bat at number five in this Indian team, but there aren't that many players who have the ability like Rahane to essentially, well, I mean, Rahane is the best slip fielder in the world off a finger spin. I think uh, I, Darren Sammy is maybe the only other person I would put in that um, uh, argument. And he hasn't, hasn't had to do that to finger spin in T20 cricket for a long time. Um, you, you've got the fact that he's really good away from home and in conditions that Indians are not traditionally um, suited to. Uh, and he's also just a really experienced player. He knows everything he needs to know about the, uh, the world game. Uh, there are, I mean, you, you mentioned Aya. Um, I suppose Vahari is another one. I'm missing. There's another really obvious one as well. I think there's a bunch of people who uh, potentially uh, could do that role. Um, but India is on, on on top of the world at the moment. You know, uh, they're, they're uh, well second, um, uh, I suppose, to New Zealand. But I would say that India is probably still the best all-round Test team in the world, um, and they 
I don't think that they need necessarily to bring Ayer in. I also don't think 27's old. Um, I can see why you're saying that, but uh, if he is that good and he does replace Rahane, you know, you sh- you might be picking him at his absolute peak when he knows the most about his game. Um, it'd be really interesting uh, to see what Raul Dravid um, thinks about him. But, I mean, I remember seeing uh, India Ray a few years ago in England. Um, there's a lot of players who are test quality batters, but maybe that their, their, their skills won't automatically transfer to test cricket outside of Asia. And uh, I think that is, that that's the same problem that kind of every test team has. That's what Engl- the same problem England has, the same problem Australia has. How do you develop those sorts of players so that you have all-round players? And I think in Rahane, even though his average is far lower than what other than what you would hope, um, what is better having someone like? And I'm, I'm not saying I would do this, but is it, is it is it better to have Ayer averaging sixty at home and thirty two away from home? Uh, and or is it better to have Rahane averaging 39 at home and 40 away from home? Um, I would suggest that you're probably going to uh, be a much better test nation if you have a Rahane in that side rather than someone who is a uh, home home player. Now, the other thing of saying all of that is that you can't get much better um, if you just keep playing domestically in India. And he has to be traveling as much as possible. He probably should be trying to play in county cricket. Um, and, you know, that that's the, the sort of... Uh, uh, the catch-22 of these kind of situations, I think, at the moment, that it is very hard for these Indian players who are not playing at the top level to get the kind of experience and growth that they need to get just because um, of the way that uh, India is. India doesn't want their players playing all around the world. They don't want to be seen as a as a feeder league for county cricket and all those sorts of things, which I completely understand because, if you know, they're an all-powerful nation um, and they want their players playing for them. But in this particular case, he is a perfect example. It's not just him. Him, Vahari, um, there's probably a couple of others I'm just, I can't think of off the top of my head, but you could easily um, slot into county cricket teams, maybe batting them at number four, give them a season or two um, to play there. Even New Zealand domestic teams is another way of doing it and developing your talent. And at the moment, um, that's not really happening. And, and I'm sure there's a bunch of different reasons for that, but – but you, look, you make a very good point. He's obviously a um, look. He's ob- he's obviously a fantastic talent, and uh, at the moment, India is not getting the most out of him. But I do think that twenty seven is probably slightly younger than you have made out. <laughs> yeah, uh, just like a small tangent from here. Um, mm-hmm. I have not seen a lot of players averaging above fifty in in uh, in Indian domestic cricket. Um, while maintaining a strike rate as high as 80. So you talked about Vihari, he's he's under 50 uh, strike rate. And I, I understand that strike rate isn't really a big deal in test cricket, obviously. But if you can average above 50, like no way does this translate to test cricket performances, obviously. But if you can average above 50 and if you have a strike rate around 80, have you seen a lot of players do that uh, in domestic cricket who, who've had a good chunk of like 4,000, 5,000 runs at least in in uh, domestic uh, red ball cricket and they average like above 50 and have an astonishingly high test cricket strike rate. Like those uh, are n- yeah. Um, no, I can't think of, I mean, anyone off the top of my head. I don't think Adam Gilchrist's record was quite, I'm trying to think what his record was uh, when he came into cricket. Um, no, uh, I'm sure there is someone I'm missing. Um, Oli Pope, I think is 65 or something, maybe 60. Um, and he hadn't made, but he hadn't made over 2000 runs, I think when, uh, when that was the case. Um, no, but uh, they, the, there are a lot of, as I said, um, there are a lot of players out there who do, do that. Also, they may not want, um, that kind of player. You, w- what you're talking about is a very base level of his stats. If, if the domestic game completely suits him, um, and let, let's say, I would assume if he's averaging over 50 in Indian domestic cricket, that it's probably, um, and he's not batting in, uh, where does he bat? What number does he bat domestically? Yeah, he bats at five. He, he bats at five. Okay. So yeah. um, so straight away, there's a problem there, uh, which I've talked about before, and there's going to be some really, really angry Pakistani fans coming on here. People do not, uh, infer, this is not my opinion. I have to stress this over and over again, because when I wrote this about Fawad Alam, a bunch of Pakistani fans who love um, Fawad Alam did not understand this. 
but I'll look this up while, while we're chatting. But essentially, there is a very strong feeling that people who bat at number five domestically are getting the absolute easiest run if they are talented batters. Now, the reason that people think this is, it is very, very rare to get to get a to be batting uh, against the new ball in first class cricket um, if you're batting at five. And first change, second change, third change bowlers are nowhere near the quality of test match um, bowlers and you you're nowhere near the amount of pressure that you face in a test match. Even batting at number five in a test match is seen as, as an easy role. Um, Mark Butcher once said, I think Mark Butcher batted number six for England once. And, you know, he batted top order his whole life. And Mark, Mark Butcher was like, this is, this is great. Why didn't anyone tell me I would have done this my whole career? It's so much easier than batting at the top of the order. And, uh, and I think that that is a, that is a huge part of what happened. So we, we, we've just seen it with Forward Alarm. I mean, go and have a look at his numbers. And I don't know what, um, so I was playing for Mumbai. So I'm assuming there's a lot of other talented uh, players there. There might be a specific reason, but there would be, there would be a feeling from old school crickety people um, that he should be batting higher up in the order. Now to say that I've just looked at his numbers and he's actually batted number three the most. Um, obviously, he hasn't played much cricket of recent times. Uh, but as you said, he's averaging 57. Um, uh, he's averaging 57 and batting at number three. Uh, batting at number four and number five, it actually drops to 40-odd uh, quite randomly there. So uh, so I don't think that should be the case unless there is a feeling that, again, um, uh, there, there is something in his particular favour. Let me just have a look at his home and away uh, first-class record here just see if there's anything – you know, if he averages 110 at Mumbai um, and nowhere else. Okay, here's another one for you. This might be part of it. He averages 58 in home matches and he averages 44 away. Uh, that is a significant drop in 40. Let's have a look here. In 23 away matches, um, he's got a strike rate of 75, an average of 45, and he's made 300s. So he's made 900, he's made 100 almost every three games at home uh, and struggling a little bit. Let me just have a look at uh, India A. India A record, he averaged 45. Strike rate is absolutely fine, so no problem there. Uh, Mumbai, he averages uh, almost 45. Uh, sorry, almost 54, uh, uh, conversely. Let me just have a look. I'm just going to dip in. This is really interesting because um, there's so many good Indian batters and I don't always get a chance to really go into them. Um, India A. He has batted, played 14 games, played 22 innings, and he's made 200s and 350s. Now, he made a double 100 in Mumbai against Australia. I think it would be very, very interesting, and I'm not going to do it now live on the chat. I think it would be very, very interesting to see what his average is away from Mumbai. Um, it seems to me... Uh, as if uh, that is somewhere where he is an incredible player. Also, um, there's another ground here that I can see. Um, it looks like that he's an incredible player. So, look, it, it's a really interesting question. I'm really glad you asked it. But that's why, with analysis, we go a lot deeper than just uh, general batting average. I remember James Hildreth. I don't, I don't know if you've heard of him, Abby, but he's, um, you know, yeah, so many so many fans, uh, well, so many fans from his county uh, will tell you what a great player he is. And when you dive into his away record, it just, it doesn't stand up. It doesn't, he's, when you look at his away record, he does not look like a test player. Um, and I'm not saying I is not, because I, I still think 45 away from home is, is just good in first class cricket. As you said, especially with a strike rate of 80. I think that that's a really interesting number. But they, but Rahane was averaging, and this might have dropped off a little bit, but he was averaging around 40 away from home in test match cricket um, while giving you experience, while giving you um, a solid mind. I mean, I think we all agree he's a really intelligent cricketer, while giving you great slip fielding to your spinners. Um, yeah, interestingly, he, Rahane has the best average for an Indian batsman away from like 44.45. It's higher than. It's 44. Oh, God, it's higher than I thought. I mean, that's a, you know, you can't buy those numbers, like, especially in the last. Four years, like most people just haven't made runs well, at home, let alone away from home. Uh, I, I, I understand that, that, especially in Indian cricket, I think there's this real feeling of like everyone needs to average 50 uh, because Indian, that has been a consistent thing, right? And you've had a lot of great batters of the, I mean, you've had a lot of great batters 
really what's it's the 70s right even if you have uh, you know so many great players but you have to understand that that is not how it works and also a player who can average 45 away from home um and ho- and average around 40 at home or whatever he does at home is probably just more worth to you than someone who can average 60 and 30 you know a david warner is a is a great great talent for australia but he's a problem when we travel Right, it's a real problem yeah. when Australia goes away from home. But great question, I really, I really, really enjoyed that. So thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. All right, I went in, went into the weeds on that one, didn't I, everyone? Uh, who have I got here? Oh, Amato. No, oh, God, I can't, can't even read your name from here. Sorry, how you doing, mate? I'm fine. How are you? Amateo, is that you? Yes. Beautiful. What's your question? So I was listening to your uh, podcast with Peter McGlashan. He said that improving the New Zealand domestic pitches help the batters to bat long and improve their test uh, batting as well. So do you think improving the county pitches, which traditionally swing and seem a lot, would help England to produce more all-round test batters? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you can't stop the ball swinging in England. Uh, you couldn't stop it swinging in New Zealand, to be fair. Um, as we saw, they're still producing a, an abnormal amount of swing bowlers. Uh, I mean, they went into that World Test Championship with four swing bowlers and Neil Wagner, who'd been working on his in-swinger as well. Uh, so uh, you're not going to stop the ball swinging in England. Uh, the Duke swing, the conditions help it. Uh, I, I can promise you this. I turned up. This is how bad. This is how bad swing bowling is in England. I turned up to a a, a ground, a very lovely ground, um, at one stage, and we. Uh, it was like a. I think it was like a lawyer's eleven or something. They asked me to come and play, and they had not a single person who could bowl seam up. And I was like, "Well, I haven't bowled seam up in a cricket game since I was fifteen. But if you want me to take the new ball, I will do it, mate." I'll tell you, I was swinging the ball around corners. I was like, this can't be real. I was, I was bowling slow as anything because I'm a leg spinner, but I was, I was pitching the ball around leg stump and it was missing off stump. It was crazy how much the ball swings. So you're not going to stop that in England. Um, and you didn't in New Zealand either, to be fair. What you can do though is you can, you can, you can give a really good solid, um, first class base, uh, pitch where, the batters um, feel comfortable, where your spinners feel comfortable, and where your um, your fast guys can hit the pitch. What you don't want is these sort of softer, greener themers because they're just uh, England cricketers are naturally going to learn how to play on those because they play them in club cricket and they play them on all the levels on the way up, and they're still going to come across them. The r- pitches in Test cricket usually favour faster bowling, usually favour spin. Um, and usually favour batters because they're five days, not four. That's kind of what I think you need to replicate if you want, um, if, if you want to be successfully, if, sorry, if you want to consistently produce really top quality batters, I think that's a really good way of going about it. Um, it's not a guarantee though. You're going to have generations where you don't find good batters. Um, and you're going to have generations where, you know, your top batters are averaging low forties rather than low fifties. I think that's a, a very normal thing. Um, that is occasionally going to happen. But uh, you need to replicate the overseas conditions. I think this is right. I think I'm getting the numbers uh, right here for you. But Somerset is the spinniest pitch in England, and it's got somewhere between, was it 27 28% of the deliveries are bold, a spin. In Asia, that you know that doesn't put it in the top 50th uh, most spinniest pitches in, in first-class cricket. Right? That, that in Asia, that's a seam bowler's pitch. Um, and yet it's called um, uh, cider bad <laughs> because of how much it's uh, how much it helps spinners. So I think that tells you straight away that there is for an England player, I think it is they are really struggling when they get to Test match a level when the, the level of spin just goes from here to here, it just jumps up massively, um, and it's a it's a really steep learning curve for them. And the other thing is just fast bowlers. If you know Darren Stevens, for those of you who don't know, is a 506 year old um, all rounder um, who just takes wickets for fun with with tiny little swingers bowling at about 68 to 72 miles an hour, and that is what your test players are facing um, when they're preparing. And then suddenly they come up and Pat Cummins is bowling to them, Jasper Brummer is bowling to them. It's a it's a different, completely different sport at a certain level. And, and this is this is a problem for England, but but you see this right across uh, the first class system. But what first class cricket does is it is very good at giving a very basic um, uh, uh, education in the red ball game uh, and how to play it and all those sorts of things. 
but it does not really tell you how to play test cricket. And I think what you need to be able to do is try and replicate that as best as possible. And I don't think it's a, a, you know, a accident that India has got a lot better as some of their pitches have been a lot better for seam bowlers. I, I don't think that's an accident because it means that when their test players are getting into um, into the national team and they're playing, they're a little bit more used to facing seam, bowl, seam bowlers all the time. Um, and there's more seam bowlers in India uh, than there was before. That's a better combination um, uh, you know, for you to warm up against. Um, but great, great, great question. Thank you very much for that. And who we've got here. Don't step on the crack. Is that what it, is that really your name? Don't <laughs> step on the crack. All right. That, that's, I mean, what, what a name your parents gave you. How can I help you? Um, I'm really interested, mate. If um, looking forward over the next few years, are cricketers going to become uh, forced to retire earlier? as the shorter format, more frequently played games take a, a greater toll on their bodies. So I'm thinking when you and I were kids, there was pretty much occasional test match and, you know, slow uh, once a week, if you're lucky, county stuff. Now you've got these young lads across all of the main cricketing countries playing double or triple the amount of games with much less rest time at what feels like a greater intensity during the game. Yeah, I don't think they're playing more games. So I went and had a look in the 60s. Um, you had uh, 50s and 60s in county cricket. You had on um, you had about 28 to 30 or sometimes even 32 first class games a year um, of three days, uh, three days a, um, a week. Three day games, sorry. So you're looking at about 90 uh, days of cricket. So um, that has to be still the most intense amount of cricket that kind of anyone has ever played. Um, uh, what you get now, as you said, is the intensity has changed. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think that there's a few different. Um, I think there's a few different things that are happening. The game is more professional now, so we have the ability to keep people on the field for longer. Um, you know, uh, you know the legendary story with Dennis Lilly, of course, is that he basically he did his back, and he I think he was number one. I think he was ranked number one bowler in the world, or was there and thereabouts in the early seventies. Does his back, and Cricket Australia is just like next. We don't need Dennis Lilly now. Um, that's not going to happen now, is it? If you have a bowler who at twenty one or twenty two is ranked number one in the world, Rabada does his back now. Cricket South Africa is not like uh, well, we'll find another Rabada. They will go off and do everything they can to you know. Uh, put his back back together. Um, so I think that's a big change. I think we understand fitness better. I think we understand biomechanics better. I think we understand diet better. I think we understand recovery better. Uh, athletes as at general, and I do mean the top level athletes, so maybe your top 10% of cricketers will go on to play longer, is my guess, not shorter. And that is because uh, they will have, you know, uh, Chris Gale traveled around the world with um, his own, um, I don't know the exact title, but like a fitness consultant. And he did that because he could afford it, and it's allowed him to play into his 40s in a way that he might not have been able to do in another era. Uh, we, you know, we are going to see those sorts of things um, more and more, I think, going into the in, into the future. But what you might get is there is an intensity to T20 cricket, and there is, there must be a there must be a toll on the body of athletes who travel as much as cricketers. Uh, you know, being in and out of planes. Uh, fast bowlers, um, you know, uh, even in, you know, you get very good business class seats on long haul flights, but on short haul flights, uh, you know, if you're uh, Mornay Morkel, your, your knees are going to be around your neck most of the time. Um, but yeah, and then, that, but that, most of the international cricketers, so I would say the 30%, the top 30% of cricketers, I don't think there will be a drop off of. There may be a drop off of um, the players between 30 and 60%. So, you know, the, the good professionals, um, just they are not going to be able to afford their own personal masseuse to travel with them. And they're not going to be able to afford um, a dietitian or uh, private coaches and all those sorts of things that you need to be able to do. And uh, the technology that now that some of the players are using um, to help them with their game, personal analysts and all these sorts of things. You know, if you look at Sean Masood, Sean Masood uh, could travel around the world to find the best doctors um, to, to help him to get completely fit and healthy for, for test cricket. I ended up working with, I think, the, um, the team who helped Crystal Palace. Um, he, he dealt with me originally as an analyst and then went uh, and then dealt a lot with the Crickvis analysts. Uh, he had 
I forget his name, but um, God, uh, Gary Palmer, um, Alistair Cook's um, batting guru, um, and he dealt with heaps of other people um, to get himself at the the, the top level, um, to get himself as fit as he could, to get his mental um, side of it as good as he could, to get the technical side of it as good as he could. Essentially, what Sean Massoud's story tells us is that money allows you to improve and stay ahead of the game. And it's, and when you're looking at everything outside of maybe fast bowling, <clears throat> It's basically cricket is a decision sport. You're making a bunch of decisions. And there is no reason why a 37-year-old player who has managed to keep their body reasonably fit cannot continue to make good decisions. Uh, we just saw Brad Hodge um, batting until he was, what, 45-ish? Um, and Hodge probably still thinks he could be out there making runs. Um, we, we've obviously seen a few spinners as well. And I think we're probably going to see in uh, Emma Stoney, Chris Gale, Shahid Afridi, um, A.B. de Villiers, uh, I think we'll see a, a, a whole host of batters uh, move into their 40s and still be and, and not be liabilities for their team. And uh, we've now got Jimmy Anderson doing the same thing. So I think we're reaching the sort of apex of, well, not the apex, but I think this is maybe the most sports science that any sports have uh, become in the world. And cricket is certainly a part of that. And I think that the, for the very top players, they'll stretch on. Uh, but we might get some burnout at the uh, other level where we, you know, where you can't get a a, a specialist who can come and uh, reconstruct your shoulder and all those sorts of things just because you can't afford it and the cricket board doesn't want to invest two years of their time into a 33-year-old um, replacement level play. Uh, does that make sense? That's, that's a great answer, mate. Really good. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for coming on. All right, who we got next here? Yeah, yeah. Hey, can you hear me? You there? Yeah. What's your question? Um, I I can't hear you. Can like I just leave I'm the talking. stage and join again if it's okay? Okay, that's weird. He can come back in a minute. Uh, Rohan, can you hear me? Rohan, Rohan, I think you might have mute on. Right, unmute Rohan. Hello. There he is. What's your question, mate? Say, I just saw your documentary the other day, the that of a gentleman, and uh, in that you are of the opinion that franchise cricket is going to kind of eat up international cricket. So I just wanted to know that is your opinion the same today? Uh, means how, what do you think? How is it affecting international cricket today? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, franchise cricket is eating up. <laughs> international cricket and has been for a long time. I think there are some people who would say uh, that it's already happened. There's already been a devaluation of franchise cricket. I think it would be hard to argue that the best quality cricket played in the world consistently is probably in the IPL. Um, uh, although we do have a great era of test cricket at the moment and one day cricket is, is reasonably strong, but I think IPL is incredibly strong. Um, yeah, I, I, one of my best examples of recent times is Kagisa Rabada. Kagisa Rabada, uh, Rabada bowled more balls than any fast bowler in the world between 2016 and 2019, despite the fact that South Africa don't uh, – that's international balls – despite the fact that South Africa don't actually play that much cricket um, because they, they don't rest him, and they don't rest him partly because he's such an important part of their play, uh, and also they don't rest him because of the quota system. Now – if that's the case, and they're going to have to play him that often, they can't then allow him to go off and play um, uh, IPL cricket or 100 cricket or anything. But Rabada makes more money from that, and he has to play that. He's only got a short career. He's you know, one back injury away from, uh, from being retired, like any bowler or knee injury or shoulder injury or however it works. Um, and so the, the, the chances are that unless a Rabada is an absolute freak athlete, um, that South Africa is going to get less out of him when he plays because he's going to be more tired. And also they may not be able to stretch his career out as long as possible. Uh, you know, there, it, we've seen what happened with the West Indies team. There's already problems when it comes to uh, uh, franchise things. And I don't blame the players. And the thing is we, we kind of blame T20 cricket for this and, and the IPL gets blamed specifically. Um, Pakistan's first test to see, uh, away series in England uh, their opening bowler only bowled in two of their test matches because he was getting paid more to play in the Lancashire leagues. 
This stuff was happening in the 1950s. Uh, cricket has not been a level playing field for a long time. And what we have allowed in is a capitalist system of franchise cricket. Um, and it is scooping up the best players, no matter where they, whether they are from Nepal or from Australia. Um, and that is, there is a natural uh, problem for a sport that was always internationally led. Now, perhaps cricket won't be internationally led going into the future. Um, and we might have to get our head around that. I think there's plenty of ways to still safeguard international cricket. Um, uh, that are not quite being uh, done correctly. I think there's ways of making a lot more money off test cricket, for instance, and making it a much more viable option for someone like Rabada. So he can consider where he wants to play. Might still want to play in the IPL. That's more than fine to him. Um, if you're a butcher and you're like one of the world's best butchers, you get to choose where you want to be a butcher. Um, and uh, we have now allowed people to make that choice in a way that was there a little bit beforehand, but it's certainly much more important uh, and much bigger now than it's ever been. Make sense? Yeah, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you for your question. All right. All right, Bamzi. Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. What's your question? Yeah, so you've worked in like a few cricket teams, right? I have. Yeah. Like, compared to like the NFL or the NBA, how well are cricket leagues on? Like, you know, in the NFL, like, everybody has their own machines, everybody has their own, you know, health positions or, you know? Well, I was an analyst for a cricket team and, uh, the NFL would have uh, 20 analysts. So I think you can tell the difference uh, on scale of what we're talking about. I remember talking to, um, uh, um, uh, oh God, I've forgotten his name. Um, Sam, uh, 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 he wrote the book. Um, uh, the only thing is that it has to work, which is about a couple of baseball nerds who take over the um, very low level of um, baseball um, club in America. And they're, they're ana analysis type people. And before I took my job, I talked to him and I said, you know, I'm going in to do this. Um, they're making me assistant to the general manager, which I think is the same title that George Costanza had in the sign in Seinfeld uh, and analyst. Uh, you know, how do I go about this? And he's like talking through it. And I said, yeah, and my, my situation is a little bit different to yours because like I've got David Warner and Kyron Pollard who probably make an all T20 team um, in the world. And they're like, and you're like the only person doing it. Like how, why, why is that the case? Why are there not more people helping you? Um, and they were very confused at that because they come from American sports where there is a structure around these things. Even when it's incorrect, there is a structure around it. Um, when I worked at Solusha, I didn't have access to video. When I worked at uh, Melbourne Stars, I didn't have access to video. When I worked at uh, Scotland, I had access to video, but because a lot of the associate teams didn't have data, I didn't have as much data on each team. I've never, ever done the analysis job, even close to the level of which I would like to do it. Plus, we don't have opposition scouts. We don't have um, people using data analysis to help our own teams. You usually got, if you're lucky, you have um, two analysts um, in a professional team, one who does video and one who does data, um, or, or across sometimes now that you have a, a cross of both now that those positions are coming in. Um, we really should have a bowling analyst a batting analyst, someone who works directly with the captain, someone who only looks at the opposition, someone who only looks at the team. That's just that level. Um, we've only just started getting wicket-keeping coaches in cricket. Like, wicket-keeping seems like a kind of big deal to me. Um, what would it be? In Western pitches, you're talking about, what, 40 to 50% of dismissals? Maybe. Am I right? I think that's right. Maybe, maybe 30 to 40%. Um uh, quite a big deal um, in spinning pitches as well. Um, and we, we didn't have wicket-keeping coaches. Uh, we still, most international teams don't have a wicket-keeping coach. When we say bowling coach, what do we mean 90% of the time? We mean fast bowling coach. It's only of recent times we started bringing in spin bowling coach. Those are not the same. We know they're not the same. I, I would argue that um, uh, a top-order um, batting coach and a middle-order batting coach are completely different things. Um, uh, we are a long way behind. Um, uh we our our professional boom has uh, stagnated because we're an international sport is my guess. If we were more of a franchise led sport uh, or a team, you know, a, a domestic league led sport, I think there would have been a bigger boom and uh, uh, cricket would have got a lot more professional, a lot quicker. But um, having said that, you know, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Uh, you know, in the England team, the Indian team, 
um, uh, the uh, clearly New Zealand's doing something right um, over there. With the, they're making a lot of good decisions. Uh, some of the IPL teams, some of the PSL teams, uh, some of the stuff that's going on across IPL and um, CPL. Um, and there's some really good analysts around. There's great analysts on Twitter who don't even get paid yet. You know, so what happens when we we start to allow those people to work with teams and um and, and to come through? So I think um that and and the coaching, I think analysis and coaching and professionalism is a long way to go. I, when I went to Solutia, here's, here's my most fun story. In fact, it's probably not my ten weirdest stories from Solutia, but uh, the equipment the that we had, the shirts and the clothes and everything, uh, were of such poor quality that they shrunk. And by the end of the tour. Um, Kyron Pollard was wearing trousers, tra- uh, his travel trousers were um, midway up his calf. They looked like they'd fit me, uh, and I'm a little bit smaller than um, Polly. Um, and uh, I-, I was just thinking, we don't even have clothes that fit us. How is this even possible? And that is uh, where professional cricket is, uh, sadly, for many teams, still stuck. So thank you very much for your question. Uh, it was great. Uh, all right, got time for about two more. So I've got the last two people lined up here. So let's go with Ayu. Hey, Jared. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, so my question is, uh, you know, do you think that uh, due to baseball's popularity in the USA, uh, probably uh, cricket may never may, may never reach the pinnacle, even though they are trying different things out with uh, the US Cricket League and all those things? Because of how similar the sports are, even though the rules are completely different and things are different, but because it involves a bat and ball, uh, do you think you know it might not reach that because they also have that sporting calendar decided? Uh, you know, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, well, baseball is going through a fundamental shift where it's probably the least popular that it's been in America mm-hmm. since the 1800s. Um, baseball is, I would say, fundamentally less exciting than T20 cricket on almost every level outside right. of the coverage of the game. Um, but they, it, it surely might have lobbies, right? I mean, it might have those powerful people behind the sport who will definitely oh yeah. not let that sport no. die, and they won't let T20 well, come to it. T20 is going to come whether there's not baseball can't kill T20, right? It, fundamentally, that is not going to happen. T20 is going to live or die on on the fact that whether there is an audience there and whether it is grown correctly, um, and whether it is developed in the way that it should be. Baseball is not going to be able to kill um, T20 cricket. I, I don't think that, I don't think baseball's even worried about it, and it wouldn't be worried about it for a long time. I don't think cricket will become the pinnacle of of American sports in the same way that football has struggled, you know, or soccer has struggled to be the pinnacle of American sports because it's not an American sport. Um, I don't see it as having a similar sport. They, they're, I know they're similar, and I know baseball is essentially an offshoot of cricket, um, but you know, a, a similar sport to me is. If you're, or if you already love rugby union, uh, will you also love rugby league? Those are similar sports. Those are incredibly similar sports. Baseball and cricket are really different um, in many different ways. And um, I think baseball will always remain a, you know, a, if not America's pastime, then at least a major part of Americana in certain parts of the country. Um, obviously, it's got a huge pull in uh, Japan and Korea. Um, Central America, uh, those sorts of places. I, you know, it, it's really popular there. Um, and uh, there are, you know, little little parts of the world where baseball is really popular uh, as well. Uh, cricket is going to grow in a different way. It's going to find its own audience in America if it is run correctly. Um, I, it doesn't need to be Major League Baseball. I mean, you're talking about cricket being in the top four sports in America. If cricket is in the top 20 sports in America, that could change everything for cricket. That's all it needs to be. Um, and who knows what will happen in 50 years' time um, it, with, with the way that sports are run um, and where, where soccer might be and where cricket might be in places like America. We have absolutely no idea. But what I know is that when cricket gets into a culture, um, generally, um, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it plants itself there and um, grows in its own way. And uh, if it can get any sort of, any sort of a foothold in American culture, um, at all, um, if if it was one tenth as big as baseball, that would that could really change the way that um, cricket is uh, grows uh, around the world. I think that's how big the American market is. 
Right. Uh, can I is can I have a follow up question on this? Or? It has to be really quick. Okay. Uh, so, which 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 market do you think cricket should target? Uh, target right now i mean is it china europe or us i mean which is the ultimate um, like the next big market that cricket All of needs them. to break through you can't you can't just target one market that's not how that's not how things go we don't know what will happen with that market we don't know how this the sporting landscape will change so you have to no. go after everything um i think japan is a country that cricket should have been spending a lot of money in for a long time i think south america is a place where argentina has been big into cricket before the brazilian women's women's team is professional i think there should be a big push um in in, in a place like brazil which has again a lot of people um right. so i think there are there there is no particular market that i think cricket needs to get into but what cricket needs is it needs japan usa brazil germany uh, China. Um, it needs one or two of these countries to come in just to um, just for the financial resources that it could bring into the game as a whole. So, um, thank you very much for your question, man. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Okay. There you are. Yeah. Hi, Jared. Can you hear me? Yeah. You got to respect the way I've said your name four different ways, and I still haven't got it right yet. Yeah. Um, I can't hear you, so I'll just hear the your answer on the podcast right now. I I don't know. There <laughs> seems to be some glitch. Like I, you can hear me, but I can't. So I'll just ask my question. So, what uh, we was talking about earlier, like replacing Rahane with Ayer, but like uh, I feel that there's a Rahane conundrum here. Like Rahane seems to when Rahane bats well, he seems to be the best play in the team. Like the either it be the partnership with virat in the world test championship final or the first test in the first test in chennai versus england he seems to bat really really well but then gets out uh, so like you you don't expect him to get out in such a way like he got out after new zealand replaced uh, new zealand placed a fielder there so also he has the highest runs by an indian in the world test championship final so like rahane doesn't seem to be scoring runs like you don't Uh, expect him to score so many runs but he ends up being the highest run scorer in the world test championship final and also end up ends up being the captain that wins your series in australia like he's a, he has an undefeated record in t- test cricket yet so like how do you deal with the players that are really beneficial to the team like they are contributing with runs and also they are contributing towards the uh, towards us like having a senior senior authority in the team so how do you deal with such players like if they are out of form and how do you see the india england series going uh, this time around yeah i'm certainly not going to answer the india english <laughs> series question after that one but um uh, rahane uh, averages 44 away from home as someone said earlier i think it's slightly lower than that if you count the um neutral test so it might be 43.5 um this whole idea of he he went out because they moved to field it doesn't matter if you go out just after they move the field it matters that you average 44 away from home it doesn't matter if you get caught in every single innings a deep cover reverse switch hitting pat cummins um if you average 45 or 44 or any 40 away from home in this modern era is incredible um uh, people get fixated on the dismissal it, w- Almost every other batter in the world goes out caught behind um, LBW bold or the slips over and over and over and over again, and somehow we see these as noble dismissals and honourable dismissal. That's how a top order. Play. It doesn't matter how you go out; it matters how many runs that you make. Um, and uh, his game plan, I think, is about uh, you know he's got, he he's got a sort of he's got a way of scoring about him. I think he knows. deep down that he's maybe slightly more limited than some of the other really top test players in the world. And so a lot of what Rahane does is God, what's a, what's a way of putting this is trying to take opportunities when he can and trying to take little risks against the players. I can't remember if it was who we went out to with it was Don Bess when Don Bess bowled a wide full toss to him um in the in the India England series um at home. Um and I th- I think he probably tried to hit that a little bit hard obviously made a mistake but that that is him trying to um he saw a full toss and he tried to take full advantage of it because that is that is kind of his game he has to take full advantage when he gets full tosses and those sorts of deliveries 
coming back to the Neil Wagner one, he probably thought, do you know what? If if I don't get off strike here, I'm just going to get peppered over and over again, and it might cause other problems, and I might get caught um, at leg slip. Um, I might get caught in another position. I might get caught down the leg side by the wicket keeper. And if I hook, I'm making even more of a of a risky situation. So what I'll try and do is just paddle the ball on the on the leg side, and he just got it wrong. The same as uh, Virat Kohli gets it wrong sometimes when he tries to um, cover drive. Um, the same as uh, Pujara gets it wrong sometimes when he's defending. Um, you know, the, the truth is that if you can, if you have a rock steady, uh, rock steady, rock steady uh, record the way that Rahane does, then you just, you know, we have to take the good with the bad. I, we, no one who watches cricket anymore seems to be able to um, understand the fact that sometimes players are just going to go out and they're going to, that's going to happen a lot especially in an era where fast bowlers are doing really well. That's a really consistent thing. Um, but i got time for one last question. I think there was one there. Where's he gone? Oh, no, here he is. Pav, you have one last question, and then I am out. Take yourself off, off mute and ask away. Pav? Oh, I... I Pav? I, uh, <laughs> I, I just leave you. <laughs> you forgot your question? Oh, you've got no question. You're done. All right. Looks like part's gone. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming um, and uh, asking some questions. Uh, it, uh, I know it, some people on Androids have trouble with Spotify Green Room. Unfortunately, it's the only place that we can record the audio at a very good level so we can put the video up on YouTube. Um, and we're going to start putting them up on our podcast on Red Inca as well. But really good questions today. I really, really I- enjoyed the chat. Uh, we're going to try and do this every Friday afternoon. Uh, we're available when there's uh, I'm not re- re- reporting from a test match or or doing some other work. Um, so yeah, follow me on a Spotify Green Room. Uh, you should get notifications when I go live. Um, and I'll, obviously, I will um, sometimes tweet out the links and other things as well. But thank you very much, and I'll hear from you again sometime soon. <laughs>